Yeah, so we have uh, worked on this in lab all week, assigning point groups using the character table flowchart. There'll be a quick kahoot here in a few minutes just to kind of check your learning and also to get, uh, sort of track that you're with us here in class. When we looked at the wave functions in a particle in a box, uh, we, we were able to identify even an odd character to those wave functions. Those dots on there are the same distance from the origin, and you can see that if they're both positive or they both have the same sign on either side of the origin, then it's an even function. And if they have opposite sign, it's an odd function. So we were able to label those wave functions even or odd. That's sort of a mathematical description. There's a whole area of mathematics called group theory. And that's what we're using in chemistry to help us understand even and odd wave functions. Today, we're going to kind of go into three dimensions with that and identify even and odd in terms of wave functions. But this inversion for this single dimension system, what we're looking at is inversion. And that's one of our symmetry elements is inversion, the little lowercase i. And so if you look up here to the uh, upper right, this... When we, when we invert that x-axis and we evaluate what's happened to the wave function, that's the inversion symmetry element. And then this character in front is the character that we have in the character tables. So the mathematicians have done a great service for us. They've generated all the character tables for all the point groups. So we've done it for a single dimension wave function. They've done this for all mathematical functions. And so what we see here is we see whenever there's an odd function, the character in front of that inversion is a minus one. When it's an even function, it's a plus one. And in this character table here, we see this minus one here, and we see this plus one here. So that's how we can assign this AG or AU to our wave functions. Those AGs and AUs are called Millikan notations. And that's really today's lecture, is focusing on how we can assign Millikan notations to the wave functions that we see. Even if it's a vibration, there's a vibrational wave function that describes the motion of those molecules. So when we draw little arrows on the molecules to show that the bond is stretching or a bond is bending, those arrows represent the wave function. So if you know what the arrows are doing, essentially you're talking about the vibrational wave function. And if you can ass assign a row in the character table, to those arrows, you've assigned the symmetry of that vibrational wave function. So everything the molecule does is governed by a wave function. The translational wave function is essentially our particle in a box wave function. The rotational wave function and the vibrational wave function and the electronic wave functions, they're all different pieces of the total wave function for the molecule. The nice thing is we can break them apart. We can look at translation, rotation, vibration, and electronic totally separately, because they really don't interact that much. And so let's focus on the character tables today. And when I talk about even, the top row is the only row in the character table that's even. All the other rows are odd in some manner. And so here are some character tables. Let's pass these out to me. This isn't every character table, but it's all the ones that we'll cover on the exams and, and most of the problems that we do. So essentially, for the first, the first symmetry exam, we're going to get a whole packet of material. And you just need to know how to use it. And so for today's one of the steps in knowing how to use the, the materials that you've provided. These are in the back of the book in one of the appendices. It's just uh, slightly, I think, might look a little nicer. Tanner, can I get you to pick up the extras? And so this is essentially on the screen, a screenshot of all the pages that you have. And you see in each of the character tables, you have a lot of rows. Every one of those rows is a different symmetry. And over on the left hand side of that row, you see the Millikan notation. A, B, A1, B1. Sometimes there is an E. Sometimes they have G's and U's. So find a character table with G's and U's, little subscripts. 
subscript G, subscript U. Those are the only character tables that have a column labeled I, inversion. So if you have a column labeled with an inversion operator, it has a G and a U, subscript. And if you notice, all the Gs are at top, and those are symmetric under inversion. They have a plus one under the I, and those Us have a minus one under I. Okay. And so there's, so there's definitely a, a pattern to all of these character tables. That's a simple one to recognize. If it doesn't have an inversion, symmetry element, then it won't have subscripts, Gs, and Us. Now, even though all of those, the top half on the, on the G portion of the character table, uh, we would say those are even under inversion, there's really only one row that's totally even under all of the operations, and that's the top row. So the top row in the character table is even. All the other rows are odd in some way. So if we have a, an integral of a function, a wave function, and that wave function is the top row, then the result is going to be non-zero. But if we have the integral over all space of a wave function that's any other row, then that integral result is going to be zero. So there's a lot of ways to have a zero integral. <laughs> there's only one way to have a non-zero integral. That will be very important when we do the direct product tables. So let's go back and just review quickly the point groups. I want to make sure I point out this vocabulary word, the Schoenflies notation. When I talk about Schoenflies notation, that's the, character, that's the point group designation, like C2V or D infinity H. Those, I just want to make sure you connect that vocabulary word with the terms we've already been using. So you use the flowchart in the lab to come up with the point group label. That point group label is called the Schoenflies notation. And that's one of the Quizlet terms that you guys can add. And you can refer to the notes on that one if you wish. Okay. So again, we, we start with the Lewis dot structure. We turn that into a Vesper shape. Then we take that Vesper shape through the flow chart and come up with the Schoenflies notation. And you can practice that Sim Otter. Here's a picture of the flow chart. And it has an example of every point group on the flow chart. So you can go back to this if you want to remind yourself of sort of classic examples of every point group. And here's the top half of the flow chart, and here's the bottom half of the flow chart. Okay. And then you can, if, if you can't really see what's going on with these, then you can go to SimOtter and go to the gallery, and you can find examples in the gallery. And with the gallery, then you can click on animate, and you can see the inversion in the S2 and S4 and all of that. So, so just uh, make sure you're super comfortable with the flow chart. And so we can practice that. Uh, just some of the ones that we don't see very often in terms of uh, molecules that you're given. Uh, the icosahedral is one that confuses people. And the uh, Buckminster Fullerene or C60 molecule is an example of an icosahedral molecule. You can see the five-fold symmetry. We're looking right down the top. There's a five-membered ring on top, and then there's one on the back side. Next time you see a sort of a traditionally patterned soccer ball, you can look at that. And this is the same exact stitching pattern on a soccer ball. Who knew that the stitching pattern on a soccer ball would actually be a pattern in nature that we would find in carbon? So someone was looking at the mass spectrum of soot, uh, Rick Smalley down at Rice, and he noticed that soot just had all kinds of carbon molecules on it. But he noticed there were certain molecules that were more abundant than others. Everybody else had looked at the same mass spec and just seen soot. But he was wondering, well, why do we have these really narrow peaks? What, what are those? And he started looking at the amount of carbon atoms it would take to make those peaks. And he noticed certain patterns in the numbers. There was a 60, and there was a 70, and it was like a 350-something or whatever. And they were the magic numbers associated with these structures, these geodesic structures that were um, uh, designed by uh, Fuller. And so he was like, interesting. Maybe there are these icosahedral, or not icosahedral, uh, these um, Fuller-like structures made out of carbon atoms. And so he discovered, and got the Nobel Prize for it, these new allotropes of carbon. An allotrope is a naturally occurring molecule or form of carbon or any other kind of 
uh, like O2 and O3, both of those are allotropes of oxygen. Okay. And carbon, we, th we knew of diamond and we knew of graphite. We did not know about the fullerenes. And so he discovered the fullerenes and got the Nobel Prize. And Bob Curl and uh, Kyoto. So, uh, so then once we know the point group, we can find the character table. And so those are the things that I just passed out to you, the character tables. The character tables allow us to determine the symmetry of the translations, rotations, vibrations in the molecule. And then later, when you get into instrumental analysis and other, other courses where you start talking about NMR, if you can exchange nuclei with any symmetry operation, they're equivalent. So that's a nice handy tool. So if you've got two protons on the opposite side of a molecule, but you can do an inversion and exchange them, then those two protons are equivalent and they'll have the same chemical shift in the NMR. So that's a nice tool. So you can look at naphthalene and you can say, okay, I can exchange the outer two protons and I can exchange the inner two protons. And so therefore I'm going to have really two chemically equivalent protons, even though I have eight in the molecule. There's going to be two peaks. Now they might have a splitting, spin, spin, splitting pattern that you have to use other techniques to figure out, but at least you'll know I'm going to have two patterns here uh, of protons. And the carbons, there'll be three types of carbons. I can exchange the outer two carbons, the middle two carbons, and then the center two carbons. So I'll have three carbon peaks in my C13 NMR spectrum. So again, you can use symmetry to simplify a lot of your chemical analyses. From the character tables, we will use the direct product tables. Look on the back of your packet. You see at the top there's a label called direct product tables. Look at them carefully right now and notice how they're different than the character tables. Someone point out a difference. Yes? Uh, like most of the rows are like A1 or... The columns yeah. and the rows. Yeah, they're not numbers. Basically. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Inside the table, they're not the characters. The characters inside the table are ones, plus ones, minus ones, sometimes twos and zeros and threes. But the direct product tables have Millikan notations in them, in the middle. Notice the columns and the, and the rows. They're also Millikan notations. So now the columns have A1, B1, uh, E, and, and T. What do you notice about inside the table? Is there another difference? Yeah, it doesn't look very, it doesn't look like they finished, do they? People are lazy. It's scientists are people. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a symmetric table. And so once you fill out one triangle, the other triangle looks the same. So you just, across the diagonal, if you, if you find you're in a, you know, like if you're trying to find um, E times B or something, and you come down and, and you realize you're in the bottom triangle, then just flip the two rows you're comparing and it'll be in the upper triangle. Okay. And so it's, a, it's symmetric around the diagonal, so they only filled out one, one half of the table. Slightly more than one half because it includes the diagonal. One other thing about the direct product. Notice that anything times itself, look at anything. So E times E contains A1, doesn't it? Or A prime. It contains uh, something with A, like A1 or A prime or AG, or A1G. Okay, we'll see, that's really an important result. So we have the character table. That's really technically the piece on the left. It has the Schoenflies notation. It has these things called irreducible representations. That's another vocabulary word. An irreducible rotation is a, is a I mean, irreducible representation is a row of the character table. But that definition really isn't very, technical, just a row of the character table. Uh, notice how if you come over to the right and look at these uh, special uh, basis functions, uh, look at the row B1. You scoot over to the right, you see that's associated with, the, with X. And B2 is Y. Okay, So these irreducible representations are the basis functions for all other motion. So if I'm going diagonal in X and Y, I have a little bit of X and a little bit of Y. So my diagonal motion would be called a reducible motion. It's reducible to X and Y. 
So the irreducible representations can't be reduced any further. They're the basis. Okay, but if I was going in, in diagonally in X and Y, I could reduce that to X and Y, the components in X and the components in Y. So that's why we use that word irreducible. We can't go any lower than this. These are the very basis of motion. And so I just put that, you know, what I just said sort of in technical terms up here. Irreducible is one of those in linearly independent vector representations. The vector is the four characters in this character table. Okay. And essentially it's that row. The reducible would be some combination of two or more of those rows. So if I was going diagonal, I would have a combination of some X motion and some Y motion. If I was going diagonal in X, Y, and Z, then I would have a combination of three rows and my motion could be reducible to the three directions. Okay. And when you get to advanced inorganic, you'll actually make some reducible representations, and then you'll learn how to, make, how to reduce them down to the irreducible representations. But we could do that, but it, it just it will slow us down and want to move on to how to use the character table. Now this Millica notation, this is the labeling scheme for those basis sets, those irreducible representations. And so here are some rules associated with, the, with what you see. Uh, if we have a, an A row, we label it A if the rotation, either proper or improper, has a character of plus 1. We label it B if the rotation symmetry is minus 1. So that's how we decide between A and B. I'm just really kind of explaining why the labels are what they are. Okay? You won't have to come up with them on your own. You have the character tables always. Uh, the two-dimensional rows, uh, things that uh, essentially have the same symmetry. So whenever you have wave functions that have the same symmetry, they're sort of exchangeable. Okay? And essentially, you can't reduce them below that. So they have uh, doubly degenerate uh, energy, and then they also have this uh, two-dimensional symmetry representation. And it's labeled E. I'm sorry. Okay? We have E for energy. We have now E for the identity operation, and then we have E for Millikan notation. So find the C3V character table, C3V. <coughs> That's probably the simplest character table that has a two-dimensional row. You see the row that's labeled E? That's what we're talking about. That's the Millikan notation, the two-dimensional row in the character table. Find the column that is the identity operation. It's labeled E as well. But notice it's a column label. So the column labels are the symmetry elements. So that column labeled E is the symmetry element of the identity. And then the rows are the Millikan notation. And that's what we're talking about on this slide right here. Uh, 3D rows. So if you have like a tetrahedral point group, if you find TD on there, you'll see some of those rows are labeled T, and that just means that's a three-dimensional row. In the tetrahedral point group, you can't tell the difference between X, Y, and Z. We can't reduce them any further than that. So they're on the same row, X, Y, and Z, and that's a three-dimensional row, and it's labeled T. And then we have the subscripts G or U, which we've already covered. That's the symmetry under inversion. And we give them a G or a U, which is German. So you're going to learn some German today. Gerade means even, and ungerade means uneven or odd. So G and U stand for, is German for even or odd. Gerade or ungerade. So you may hear me throw that out just because I've been doing this a while, and I may say, oh, that's gerade. You're like, what did he just say? <laughs> so I'm speaking German. That's probably that and V Gates are about all the German I know. Basically means what's up. So, so let's. Um, that's the Millikan notation, and now we'll learn how to assign that Millikan notation. But first, let's do a Kahoot. We're all here and ready to go.
took a while to come up. You're irritating me. Okay, there's your code. Eight six zero six zero one. Are y'all gonna play? Okay, I'm just checking to make sure, because I need to know how many people play. Five. Should be everybody. That's the fastest we've ever logged in. How far does a C4 element rotate the molecule? Yay, fantastic. One fourth of a turn. So that little number is the, the, the fraction. Yes. Okay. <coughs> True, false. Wow, that was fast. Okay, good. Think about benzene. Benzene has an inversion center, but no central atom. This goes back to your lab. Point group for water is, dun, dun, dun. Our choices are red, CS, blue, C4V, orange or yellow, C2V, and green is TD. You say TD, I'm gonna come sit on you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Point group for methane. This one ought to be automatic, folks. This is the one that I'm, I get really irritated, irritated about that people miss. Not today, though, but if you miss this on the test, I like fuss at you and tell you to change your major and go away. <laughs> <laughs> I did that, and then I got. <laughs> yeah, tetrahedral. That's like the classic example of a tetrahedral molecule is, is methane. Okay, and so even the Vesper shape, you got four electron domains, what is that called? Tetrahedral. So, yeah, so I'm not going to tell you to change your major today, but if you miss that on the test, I might. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new question this year, in case you've already taken this. The point group of the human body is approximately... No, it's for real. It's for yeah. Real. Here I am. <laughs> Do I wrote? I don't have a C2, right? Unless you're saying that. Oh, my. Oh, it's pretty even spread, yeah. I've got a mirror plane, and that's it. So CS, that S, I think of it as kind of like C sigma, right? Sigma plane, CS. So uh, if, if your molecule only has a mirror plane, then it's CS. That was a pretty even split. It's just like, who the heck knows? Yeah. Of course, your esophagus doesn't go straight down. It kind of covers to the right. So that's why I said approximately. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what do we need to do? All right. Let me go back. Okay. So let's focus on assigning and looking notations. 
Okay, so today really want to focus on getting up to speed. Now that you know the, the point groups because you did such a great job in lab, then you've got the character table because the point group just tells you which table to use. So that's easy. Once you know the point group, go find the table. But now you have all these rows. And we have a lot of things that a molecule can do. Okay, so now we're, we're down here to understanding the character tables. And part of understanding the character tables is understanding how to describe the molecular motions in terms of the rows of the character table. This is saving us an enormous amount of math. If you thought doing the transition dipole moment integral for a particle in a box in one dimension was cumbersome, think about doing it in three dimensions. No way. I mean, and so these are the, the total number of motions that water can undergo. So if you think about an atom, an atom can do three things. It can translate in X, Y, or Z, and that's it. If I put two atoms together, I still have three degrees of freedom for every atom. So for, I mean, even up to your body, the total number of atoms you have, three in is the total degrees of freedom. But even this collection of atoms that I have, I, as far as translation, I can go in the X direction, the Y direction, or the Z direction. Now, if my atoms are all going in the same direction, that's called translation. So in water, look at that top row. Those are my three translations. All three atoms are going in the same direction. If they're going in different directions, like if the, the, um, this side of my body goes forward and this side of my body goes backwards, then that's rotation. So if I just kick my atoms in opposite directions around that symmetry axis, then I spin, okay? What if my hands go in opposite directions? That's a vibration. Hopefully there's a spring constant that turns them around. Otherwise they get pulled off my body, okay? And that's vibration. So if it's not, and vibration is defined sort of in a negative manner. If it's not translation, if it's not rotation, it must be vibration. So everything else is vibration. So in water, we have our three translations up there. There's always three translations, and there's only three translations. So write that down, because that's something people miss all the time. Translation, always three and only three. <laughs> and they are X, Y, and Z, the three Cart Cartesian coordinates. So we have three in total degrees of freedom, and three of those are translations. For water, we have three rotations. And for a nonlinear molecule, so write this down, nonlinear molecules, we have three rotations. See, I'm feeling, feeling good. I'm going to do my three demonstrations here. So we have only three things that an object can do. It can spin around the z-axis, okay? It can spin around the y-axis, okay? <laughs> All right? And it can go around the x-axis. No, no, no. Oh. Okay, so <laughs> that's it. A forward roll, a cartwheel, or a spin. All right. So that's it. The three, that's three rotations for a nonlinear molecule. Okay? And I'm not linear. I'm, I'm trying to be, but I'm on a diet, but I can't quite get to linear. Okay? Now, a, a linear molecule only has two. Okay? Because the, the motion is defined by <laughs> its moment of inertia. And if you have a linear molecule, all the atoms are on the axis, so there's nothing off the axis. So I can't tell if it's rotating around the z-axis. 
So we lose that rotation. So a linear molecule only has two. So write that down. That's important. And the reason it's important is because the vibrations are defined as anything not rotation and not vibration. Oh, sorry. Not translation or not rotation. So if we're wrong on rotation, we're wrong about vibrations. Right? And so this will make a big, uh, this will have a huge impact if we're trying to come up with the number of vibrations and we've messed up the rotations. Okay, so then in water, we're left with three vibrations, 3n minus six. And so that minus six is the important piece here. It's subtracting the translations and subtracting the rotations because those are not vibration. You see how vibration is defined as negative? It's not translation, not rotation. So that's the minus six part. So 3n, however many that is, that's huge potentially. Like for my body, that's huge. But I'm subtracting my three rotations and my three translations and everything else is vibrations. And what I've shown on the screen here are all nine motions for water. I have the XYZ translations, I have the RX, RY, and RZ. That's what that capital R with a subscript X means, rotation around X. And rotation around Y and rotation around Z. Okay, but then the vibrations this is where we get into the little arrows that try to show what's going on. So the arrow on the left, the far left, that's the symmetric stretch. Symmetric because both bonds are stretching in phase with each other at the same time. And so they're doing this. There's, these are the hydrogens, and the oxygen is my head, and so they're doing this. Okay, and the head's going up just a little bit like that. Crazy dance move, right? If they were doing this, you'd kind of be... Freaked out, I'm sure. Okay. Um, so the symmetric stretch doesn't look so good. The reason that oxygen goes up a little bit is because the center of mass cannot move. If the center of mass moves, that's translation. And this is not translation. So the center of mass stays put. Okay. And then the asymmetric stretch is over here where one bond shrinks while the other one stretches. And so now it's like that. Okay, so this is stretching while this one's compressing, and then this one's doing the opposite. Okay, and the center mass doesn't move. Okay, these my crazy dance moves. I like this one better than the symmetric stretch. Okay, <laughs> and then they have the, the bending motion. So you've got the hydrogens here, and that's 90 degrees to the bond. So it's just showing you the impulse on that hydrogen. It's doing this. Notice the bonds aren't stretching, because that would be a stretching mode. This is only bending. We're just changing the angle between the hydrogen bonds, so it's doing that. So bends don't change the bond lengths, and stretches shouldn't change the angles if they're pure. Sometimes the modes aren't exactly pure. Okay, but in water, these are three pure modes. They're stretches or bends. And those are the three vibrations that we can come up with. There are no other ways that water can vibrate. Either you've got an angle and two bond lengths, you come in with three molecular things, coordinates, if you will, you're going to get three vibrations out of that. And since the bond lengths are the same spring constant and the same mass, they couple with each other, either symmetrically or asymmetrically. And then there's nothing for the angle to couple with. But if you're methane, you know, you've got all kinds of things to couple with. All can stretch at the same time or different times. Okay, you can have the different angles this way, that way, this way, twist. Okay, so you have all those different, if you've got four angles, you've got four different bends. Bond lengths stay the same for those. I always thought this would be a great dance like thing we could do. I want to have a talent show across campus where each college provides teams and we could have like a, a dance troupe to do the motions of a molecule. <laughs> I think we would totally win. You know, because they'd be like, what is that? And so you do it over in the dance studio where they have the scrim behind it and a projector. And we can show the results of like quantum mechanical calculations where the atoms are doing it and we're doing the thing. <laughs> It'd be so great. It's excellent in my head. Let me just tell you that. Yeah. So these are top ones are easy. These bottom ones assigning. OK, one thing that we did here. Notice I have A1, B2, B1. All of those are assigned. 
These are Millikan notations here. Notice, see, all of these have a Millikan notation. So let me back up to the character table. And you see over here, X, here X, Y, and Z. So if I have translation in Z, I just find Z in this table and move to the left, it's A1. Piece of cake. If I have translation in X, find X, scoot over, it's B1. Find Y, scoot over, it's B2. So that's easy. What about rotation? Rotation around the Z axis is A2. So you find R sub Z, that's rotation around Z, scoot to the left, that's your Millikan notation. So that's what I mean by assigning the Millikan notations for the top six are easy. And the bottom ones are, are supposed to be easy after today. Okay? <laughs> So let's look at this motion here, this, this asymmetric stretch and the symmetric stretch and the symmetric bend. And let's take these arrows. You'll be given the arrows for this motion and asked to supply the B2 or the A1 or the A2 or the B2. So let's look at those. So here are the, uh, here's the symmetric stretch. And notice if I uh, stretch that molecule, it, cr it creates a little bit longer dipole. So I've drawn the dipole in water here. That's what this arrow represents. So this is the way you draw a dipole. You have kind of a positive end, and the arrow points towards the negative end. Remember on oxygen, we have these lone pairs, or non-bonded pairs of electrons. And so this is a very negative part of the molecule. This is a very positive part of the molecule. And when I stretch those those uh, bonds, the dipole gets longer. And when I compress the bonds, the dipole gets shorter. And so the dipole goes up and down in the Z direction. Well, if the dipole changes in the Z direction, then it's Z. And you go to the character table, find Z, go to the left, it's A1. Now, if you can't see how the dipole changes, that's understandable. Let's take those motion vectors and let's break them into their components. So notice we have the z-axis up there. We can look at the z-components of those vectors. So this arrow is a vector, and it's going diagonal. And if you have a diagonal arrow, let's look at the Cartesian coordinate system and break it into its components. So the part that goes down is a down arrow along the z-axis. And then the x part, or the y part, is the horizontal arrow, arrows. So you go up to your coordinate system, and you see the Z is up and down, Y is left and right, and so each of these arrows has a left and right component and an up and down component. Okay? And notice that the left and right component are going in opposite directions. So it's like those vectors cancel each other out. So those we can put X's on, the, the, meaning canceling, not the X axis, but the, those we can cancel out. So the, the parts of the hydrogen, the electrical, we're talking about the electric field, the, the, the Y components of the electric field don't change. But the Z components of the electric field do change. And so we're actually oscillating the electric field in the Z direction by moving those mostly positive hydrogens up and down like that. And so this is the change in the dipole moment. It's along the Z axis. And so therefore, this motion is, has Z symmetry. That's what we're trying to find is what's the symmetry of this motion. Does everybody understand the exercise? We're trying to find the symmetry of the motion. If the horizontal pieces cancel, they're canceled. The pieces that don't cancel are the symmetry of that motion. I'll let you chew on that for a second. Let's do another one. So let's look at the, um, okay, so I just have a couple. Let's see, find Z in the character table, go left, and it's A1. Okay, so that's the motion of the symmetric stretch. Here's the symmetric bend. So we look at the Z components of those arrows. They both go down. The Y components both go in, but because the arrows are going in opposite directions, they cancel out. And so, once again, this changes the electric field in the z-direction 
we go find Z in the character table, move left, it's A1. So that would be A1 symmetry for this vibrational motion. You feel like you could do this? If I gave you the arrows on a molecule, you could look at the X, Y, and Z co components and cancel things out. That's, that's the exercise that you'll need to be proficient in. So let's find one that's not Z, asymmetric stretch. So the not symmetric stretch. So the Z components now of those two hydrogen arrows cancel out. And there is no Z component for the oxygen motion. And the Y components are all going in this particular diagram to the left. At some time later, they'll switch direction and go to the right. So this is changing the electric field in the Y direction. And it's setting up a dipole where one didn't exist. The water molecule is symmetric, but when you shrink one bond and stretch the other, it's no longer symmetric left and right. And so there's a dipole now that goes left and right in this molecule with this vibration. And so because it's oscillating the electric field in the Y direction, you go up into the character table, find Y, scoot left, and you see that it's B2. This is probably the easiest way to, to assign those, is to break it into the components. Okay. But sometimes, like in a very symmetric molecule, all of them cancel out. And if all of them cancel out, it's top row. Because <laughs> it's so symmetric, everything's canceled out. Like in benzene, if all six hydrogens stretch at the same time, for every component going up, you're going to have a component that's going down. And for every component going left, you're going to have one going right. And, and if all of those things cancel out, then it's going to be top row. Okay. So um, this is what's going on with the symmetries. And just like in the particle in a box, those symmetries um, help us label the energy levels. So we started with a particle in a box, but we have to talk about other systems, especially with vibration. We need to talk about the vibrational levels. And so the even-numbered quantum states, and it starts with V equals zero. Uh, Y'all were good at, um, um, on the exam, correcting that N equals zero to one. That was an incorrect statement of that student. And you were like, it doesn't start with zero. It starts with one. Very good on the particle in a box. But for vibrational motion, it does start with zero. Okay. So if that trips you up, be sure to make note of that. For vibrational motion, the ground state is zero, V equals zero. And so the even numbered vibrational quantum number states, so zero, two, four, et cetera, are top row symmetry. And in, in our water molecule, that's A1. Okay. But I can't say it's always A1 because you might have a different molecule like uh, um, benzene that's D6H, and so it would be A1G for benzene. Okay. So it's top row. That's, that's universal. Whatever that point group is, the character table, you find the top row. That's what the even vibrational states are. The odd ones are the symmetry of the motion. So if I have the asymmetric stretch and it's B2, then V equals 1, 3, 5, and 7 are B2. So notice now I've, I've been able to label all of my energy levels A1, B2, A1, B2 for the asymmetric stretch in water. And this allows me to solve for my selection rules without doing 20 pages of math. Okay. I can tell you if the 0 to 1 transition is allowed or not now. Now that I have the symmetries. And that's what the direct product table is useful for. Okay. But today's main task was just assigning those Millikan notations. I'm just showing you how it will be used next. Okay. Uh, we can um, look at molecular orbitals too. And so let's skip quickly through this uh, projection operator. We'll do it more more detail later. And uh, look at the, the orbitals. So these are three orbitals in... Ammonia. Let me draw the coordinate system on here. Let's let's see. Let's look at this one here. Okay. 
And if you look at the colors, what do we mean by uh, these colors in our molecular orbitals or in our atomic orbitals, like a p orbital? Do you know what those colors mean? Sometimes we label them plus and minus, which is a little confusing because it's not charge. Okay, we're not labeling the wave function with charge. Think of the, the, the particle in a one-dimensional box, the first excited state. Half of the wave function is going up, the other half is going down. And sometime later, they swap places. So if we take a snapshot where part of it's positive, the other part's negative, that's the plus and minus we're showing on this. Okay, so those colors represent the oscillations of a wave. Now, we're dealing with an electron cloud. So think about this motion here. This wave function here, it's got a red side and a green side. All that means is that the cloud is sloshing left and right. So if we label red as, as expanding, then the right side of the molecule is expanding while the left side shrinks in terms of the electron cloud. And then sometime later it swaps direction. The left side will expand and the right side will shrink. And so this is just showing the electron cloud is sloshing left and right. Get that in your head. The green and red just mean how it's sloshing. Think of it as direction. Now we don't want to draw one small and one big, so we just change the colors. We say one color versus the other and just pick one. Say red is shrinking, green is expanding, so it's sloshing in one direction. What direction is it sloshing on the one on the right? X. It's sloshing in the X direction. Can you see that? If I'm looking at the bathtub and half is getting big and the other half is getting small and I look at it and say, oh, this is the X direction. The water is sloshing in the X direction. And sometime later, maybe the bathtub is sloshing this way. Oh, it's sloshing now in the Y direction. That's what these pictures mean. For a P orbital, it's sloshing up and down on a PZ, left and right and a PY, forward and back and a PX. Okay. And so that's what these pictures mean. So the one on the, on the left is sloshing up and down. And the way I've drawn the coordinate system, that's the, that's the Y direction. So if you can make that mental connection, these are easy. You just look to say, okay, what are the colors? And are they, if the colors are sloshing, how is the electron cloud sloshing? Sloshing in the X direction. doesn't matter what the shape is. It's just where's the node, really? See where that node is? The node is telling you sort of it's sloshing past that node left and right. Okay. Um, the top one, that's a weird one. There's no node there. That would be a really weird one in a bathtub. The whole bathtub's getting fuller and then shrinking, and then getting fuller and getting shrinking. So it's sloshing out in all directions, and it's totally symmetric, right? There are no nodes, so that's going to be top row. So that, that top one is fully symmetric, top row. The ones on the bottom are X or Y, depending. And if you go to the C3V character table, because that's this molecule's character table, so once you do that real quick and we'll be done. C3V character table for ammonia. Do you see that, that X and Y are on the same row? That's going to be E. And E is going to capture both of these wave functions because both of those wave functions have the same energy. So that's, that's sort of a foreshadowing of, of how to do um, molecular orbitals. So we'll go deeper uh, throughout the semester. So have a great day. Have a good weekend.